For the latest in strategic affairs, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell icon for updates. This is Strat News Global. I'm Amit Abrevi. Our guest today is Ambassador Pankaj Saran. He's been India's former Deputy NSA and also India's envoy to Bangladesh. Ambassador, thanks so much for Thank your time. You. Prime Minister Asina's visit. There were a lot of takeaways as such, but if I just start with some of them, whether it's connectivity, whether they're talking about uh, a SIPA being initiated at least, maybe it takes a couple of years. How significant are those in your mind and, and why? Yeah, I think, I think the visit is very timely. You know, there was a bit of a hiatus in the high-level exchanges, especially from the Bangladeshi side, because last year Prime Minister Modi had gone. So I think it's very good that the leaders are meeting regularly. And I would say that is the first element of the takeaway from my point of view, that she actually decided to come uh, to India. And then on the agenda and the takeaways, the relationship has moved so much in the last few years that it's become extraordinarily comprehensive and very deep-rooted. And that, I think, is very good. It's a good, healthy development. Uh, and I don't think it's a truism or a slogan, but it is actually true that this has become a model for the rest of the region. So I would say, yes, in terms of, say, connectivity, uh, so much has happened, and we can discuss it in all sections of uh, human activity, and including, for example, trade. And uh, yes, the SEPA is a good uh, initiative because it takes you one step further towards economic integration. And I think that is really something which we must move forward on relentlessly. Relentlessly is something we haven't moved forward on in terms of water sharing, though there has been an agreement this time after uh, over a decade, I think. Tista has been a stumbling block because of domestic reasons. How significant is that? Because the Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina mentioned 54 rivers and how uh, you know problems should be sorted out. Yeah, you know, water sharing has been a top priority for Bangladesh. I mean, uh, the last time we had the agreement was the Ganges Treaty in 1996. In fact, it's coming up for renewal. But it's actually worked very well. The, it was a 30-year treaty. So it's, it's been a good example of uh, an international agreement. So Tista is, a, is an issue uh, for Bangladesh uh, domestically as well as in terms of uh, water availability. But this and this has been discussed with the Bangladeshi government and the Prime Minister for the last few years. And uh, it has been told to them that, look, there is a problem within India also because we have to recognize that there is an overall shortage of water in the Tista. And, you know, the governments of Sikkim and West Bengal are both involved. So the building of a consensus within the uh, various stakeholders in India, primarily the states, is actually a prerequisite to going into an international agreement. So this is, uh, I admit, a bit of a sore point with Bangladesh. But the point is that we have been in conversation with them and uh, we want to move forward. Uh, it is only that it is taking more time than an anticipated to build that internal domestic consensus. But I'm glad that uh, the other agreement on the Kushiara River was signed. I think that's good. The other good development is that the meeting of the Joint Rivers Commission took place a few weeks ago. That is also a good sign. And, uh, you know, the two sides have already identified six other smaller rivers where they have more or less agreed on the formula for sharing. So, going beyond water sharing, I think we also have to look at uh, water management uh, we have to look at flood mitigation. We have to look at uh, what to do during the periods of drought. Uh, because Bangladesh is a riverine country, and so is the parts of the Northeast. So, and we have all these common rivers flowing. Uh, so there is so much to do, it's, which goes beyond the simple uh, act of sharing. And uh, we have to see how we can augment the flows, how we can manage them. Uh, and then, you know, I, I think in the last few years, the other good 
very good uh, development that has taken place is the revival of the inland waterways and transportation along the waterways which actually had been neglected for a long time and that has its own challenges you know that includes uh, dredging it includes uh, building of small ports uh, it includes uh, a mindset shift uh, on behalf of the trading community that instead of using the overcrowded and over congested land or rail routes you shift transportation to the waterways so i think it's a full uh, kind of a package that we need to address must again connectivity when you're talking about you mentioned riverine whether it's trade or otherwise but uh, development projects that we are helping in a bangladesh bail road those are very significant both for bangladesh internally and like you're saying as a regional model for us yeah i think you know if you segregate development projects with connectivity projects you know connectivity projects are a subset of your total development package to bangladesh because there are many parts of the development cooperation which are not strictly connectivity but are basically geared to enhancing their infrastructure etc but on the connectivity part i think we made huge strides uh, and it's not just physical connectivity in terms of say for example revival of the pre 1965 rail links which was a very daring and ambitious goal set by prime minister hasina herself or uh, for example your road linkages or as i said the train linkages because again you know rail as a mode of transportation was neglected uh, by bangladesh and by india and you know can you imagine that there are parts of bangladesh which run on broad gauge and there are parts which run on meter gauge so even connectivity within bangladesh is a challenge and then of course apart from this you have other forms of connectivity which has mentioned inland waterways again a new development has been uh, the use of coastal waters and coastal shipping uh, as a means of uh, transportation of goods to begin with and hopefully people and then air connectivity is today uh, you know you have flights from dhaka and other cities in bangladesh to almost uh, all the major metros in india and there are definitely multiple flights a day and then of course i would say energy connectivity has become a very very successful model and this includes uh, sale of power uh, transportation of high speed diesel through a pipeline uh, you know it's so many host of things that are happening uh, and all this is actually leading up to concrete uh, results in terms of say economic growth rates uh, and uh, expansion of the economic uh, basket uh, for bangladesh for the northeast and finally i think of course uh, you know if we can use bangladeshi ports or the land routes to transport some of our goods to the northeast which are landlocked that of course is uh, extremely useful for us and very important for us these points that you're making about the northeast uh, master so it's it's not a one way street india is gaining a whole lot from all these connectivity projects whether it's like you said ports or rail links or road links for the northeast itself it, of course uh, i mean uh, we are gaining and um, uh, this is uh, something which uh, we are grateful to bangladesh for Uh, and it actually required uh, a lot of forward thinking and uh, kind of an ambitious uh, mindset on the part of the bangladeshis to overcome their initial fears but now this is beginning to happen it i wouldn't say it's like a uh, a huge uh, traffic but it's happening in uh, bits and pieces but the fact is that the mental barrier seems to have been broken whether you look at inland waterways or you look at say ports like uh, chittagong or chattogram and mongla uh, or uh, coastal so what is happening is that in this process uh, you are creating virtuous cycles i would say of prosperity in the northeast and even within bangladesh and so the other uh, kind of manifestation of uh, benefit is the fact that the indian market has actually opened up to bangladesh for their industry for their trade for their uh, textile sector so the connectivity is uh, not one way in fact i would say it is a two way connectivity where on the indian side our market has been thrown open virtually to bangladesh and that's something which uh, is also 
uh, showing benefits. In terms of uh, defense and security cooperation, there's a $500 million line of credit that we had offered Bangladesh. And I think Foreign Secretary Quatra did mention that there has been some modest signing of contracts. Uh, we don't know what <laughs> exactly, didn't mention what it was. But on, on that front, uh, how do you see India and Bangladesh? Yeah, so you know, again, this is a new area. I mean, for example, till uh, a few years ago, we actually did not have a defense dialogue with Bangladesh. And that began a few years ago, and I think it was a good initiative. And you know, both sides uh, willingly went into this, uh, and so Defense Secretary uh, went and on both sides, etc. So this is very good. Similarly, the Defense Credit Line, the five hundred million dollars, is a new initiative, and it's good. It's uh, it's uh, again, it's a breakthrough, uh, and the progress is not as fast as we would have liked. Uh, but you know, uh, when you start something new. There will be, uh, you know, hiccups, procedural uh, policy, but we are making progress, and I think we, sh you know, there's a lot we can offer. Actually, if you come to think of it, for the Bangladeshi armed forces, uh, including, I would say, even things like joint production in Bangladesh, uh, you know, uh, servicing of equipment. Uh, we can begin with the supply of non-lethal weapons, non-lethal equipment. Uh, we can do so much with them and uh, I just hope that uh, you know there is uh, uh, perseverance on this front and that we keep moving forward. I think there is a lot of synergy uh, between the armed forces and uh, also you know it's good that you're having joint exercises. There are regular exchange of visits uh, at the leadership level. Uh, there are officers going for training and all this must continue and I think it's important for us as India you know, to be able to explain to the Bangladeshis uh, that India is not a threat to their national security. Um, you know, there is no military threat that you face from India. Again, the Foreign Secretary Quattra in his briefing was very diplomatic when he was asked questions about China and inroads into Bangladesh, security concerns that India has. He did say that all manner of security concerns were discussed. How much uh, worry or concern is it for India, uh, China's presence there in various dimensions? No, you see China has been pursuing a fairly aggressive stance vis-a-vis uh, -vis all our neighbours, uh, particularly those which are contiguous uh, to us. And uh, sometimes uh, it is quite evident that the money that they are pouring in is not actually strictly for commercial and industrial or development purposes but is evident eminently is you know it's obviously for dual use application and this is a matter of worry for us and we do not want a situation where china uses the or exploits you know the vulnerabilities of these smaller neighbors or smaller countries to pursue its own agenda vis-a-vis -vis india and so uh, we have been in conversation with bangladesh to say that look when it comes to your development uh, agenda the growth of your economy, you know, all that is unexceptionable. But where we have a problem is when we find that there are activities or projects or other initiatives being taken, which uh, in our opinion uh, are disproportionate to your needs. And uh, there is uh, definitely an element of um, uh, a dual use intent uh, which is visible. So, you know, whether it is uh, port infrastructure, whether it is um, weapon supplies to the Bangladeshi armed forces, whether it is uh, kind of using your financial resources as China to kind of somehow tie down Bangladesh and to uh, which results in uh, kind of constraining their ability to take sovereign decisions vis-a-vis uh, -vis their foreign policy or you know make them unnaturally dependent on uh, on china uh, whether it's in the form of the decision making uh, processes uh, etc or domination of certain sectors these are unhealthy and uh, you know i mean they sometimes uh, uh, clearly go beyond uh, normal interstate uh, commercial and development cooperation so i think yes it is a matter of worry for us no doubt have the Bangladeshis been responsive to our concerns? 
Well, the Bangladeshis say, of course, that uh, they are responsive. I mean, they recognize that because, you know, uh, they are seeing this uh, pattern of Chinese behavior, uh, not just in their own country, but in the rest of uh, the subcontinent and in the rest of the world. So they are cautious, they are very, they do not want to, uh, you know, I suppose, uh, uh, cross a red line when it comes to us. But uh, on the other hand, uh, they also argue that everything that is happening between them and China is uh, completely commercial, it is a normal development cooperation. But uh, so there is both sides of it, you know, they, they recognize that, uh, you know, there is a, you know, that we have concerns. And, you know, geography is very important here because uh, Bangladesh basically sits inside India. So, just as you know, if I were to do something on Indian soil or territory which affects Bangladesh's security, uh, I would understand if Bangladesh would get uh, worried or concerned. It's, it's because security is mutual, uh, it can't be one sided. So, so they, they do recognize it, but on the other hand, at the official level, of course, they, uh, they claim that there is nothing unusual about their relationship. But, you know, we have to also sift the facts from the statements. You, you were mentioning about, say, development projects which uh, they are justified to pursue uh, under their own uh, sovereign decisions. But similar, like you were talking about other countries in the region, whether it's Sri Lanka, whether it's uh, Maldives, do you see uh, countries, no matter who, which government is in power, are playing this balancing act to try and leverage the best that they can get from two major powers in the region, which is India and China. Yeah, look, I think India's strengths are uh, very different from China's strengths. And uh, geographically, I mean, if you talk of contiguity and uh, interdependence and historical linkages, uh, you know, uh, clearly uh, we are in a very unique situation vis-a-vis -vis Sri Lanka or the Maldives or, or Nepal or, uh, or, or Bangladesh. So, uh, I mean, there is really no comparison. What, what is happening is that because of China's uh, financial clout and economic clout, they're clearly, you know, using it to advance uh, strategic goals. Uh, so, again, here, you know, if you look at their statements, uh, these are, uh, you know, fairly well worded and uh, they look uh, unexceptionable. But when you look at the actual projects and the kind of uh, activities that China is doing increasingly in these smaller countries, uh, these raise a lot of doubts about their true intent. And uh, definitely, I think uh, these smaller neighbors, they understand and recognize that, uh, you know, their future and their stability and their prosperity in the long term is basically linked inextricably to India because of the so many linkages, whether cultural, linguistic, uh, religious, historical. So it's very difficult to uh, kind of de-link uh, these neighbors from India. And um, as we grow further and faster, uh, these countries will also benefit from India's growth. And like you're saying, they're aware of the lessons that other countries have learned. I think a recent statement by the finance minister about the BRI and how Bangladesh should be wary of falling into any of the cases that other countries have. But your assessment, Ambassador, the economic situation in Bangladesh, because there are reports of protests, fuel prices, energy prices, uh, elections are due, there are political violence that has also been reported in the streets, etc. How bad a situation is Bangladesh in? Because officially, say, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina will deny any problems about debt or forex, any of those. But there is a certain set of analysts who warn that there's a possibility that Bangladesh could go the Sri Lanka or the Pakistan way. They, they've asked for an IMF loan just, what, last month? You know, see, look, the macro figures, the macro indicators of Bangladesh seem to be pretty stable. You know, if you look at, say, for example, GDP growth rates, foreign exchange reserves, uh, the trade, current account deficit, uh, rate of inflation, value of the taka, all these are okay, you know, right now. But 
the Ukrainian crisis has actually led to some uh, you know, blowback in terms of, say, supply chain disruptions, in terms of uh, increase in energy prices. Of course, you know, Bangladesh imports everything in terms of its energy. Uh, so its entire oil and uh, gas also is, uh, the production is really low. So they are heavily energy dependent. So I think they have to be careful. You know, there are structural issues. I mean, you have to increase your tax base. Uh, you have to ensure that your revenue keeps coming. There's been a huge expansion, say, for example, of their power sector. You just have to make sure that the utilities are in good financial health. Um, so these are some issues, uh, of course. So therefore, if your imports are going to surge, you know, you will have to be wary of your foreign exchange reserves, your current account deficit. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a constant uh, kind of uh, uh, tuning, fine tuning that you have to do uh, to the economy. But uh, there is no doubt that if you look at the broader picture, uh, the economy has done very well in the last 10-15 uh, years. And, uh, but you have to also then take care of you know, inequalities within society. Uh, so there are issues. Uh, employment is a big uh, issue. I think, you know, for example, the textiles uh, or ready-made garment sector is a genuine success story, and uh, you know it employs about four million Bangladeshis. Most of them are women. So it's country. It's been a huge social safety net, apart from being the largest foreign exchange earner. And you know, today the size of the Bangladeshi economy is bigger than that of Pakistan. This would have been unthinkable 20, 30 years ago. And many of their uh, figures are better than India's in terms of human development indices. Yes. <laughs> That's right. Uh, again, when you're talking about India and Bangladesh, and there's been a close relationship between Sheikh Hasina's government and Narendra Modi's government for successive terms. India's relationship with other political powers there, are they beyond... Uh, what is the word for it? Should India be not putting all their eggs in one basket is, I guess, what I'm asking in terms of uh, yeah. political. <laughs> you know, the India relationship, if you, are, if you live in Dhaka, the India relationship is the dominant relationship for the Bangladeshi uh, decision makers, the elites, and everyone talks about uh, the relationship with India because that overwhelms everything else. Um, and so also, whether you like it or not, uh, you know, it does get sucked into their domestic politics. As far as we are concerned, I think, you know, uh, we have a track record of actually dealing with every single government uh, that came to office in Bangladesh, whether they were military dictators or, uh, uh, you know, the other opposition parties. Uh, so we've dealt with all of them. Of course, our degree of success has varied. Uh, you know, depending on the response from the other side. So I think at the moment, since Sheikh Hasina is the Prime Minister, and she's been there for since 2008, and she is in control, uh, and she uh, has made it a known public uh, posture that she wants good relations with India. Uh, I think it is uh, logical for us to actually then uh, go forward with her to build these relations uh, and, and actually, you know, make them in a sense uh, durable and also irreversible and also get uh, buy-in from the majority of the population in Bangladesh to show that, you know, if you have good relations with India, it is a benefit to you as well as to India, of course, but it's a direct benefit to the people of Bangladesh. And, uh, you know, there are statistics, you know, for example, if you look at the Bangladeshi growth rate in the last 10, 15 years, it's actually coterminous with the opening up of the Bangladeshi economy uh, to India and the opening up of, uh, and, the, and the fast pace of integration, including connectivity with India. This is exactly the opposite of what we are witnessing on the western border, where the borders are shut. There is no commerce, there is no trade, there is no investment, there is no people to people, and that economy is collapsing. So the lesson here for Bangladesh and for the rest of the region is, if you open it up, your dealings with India, you know, it actually helps in your economic uh, growth rate. So I think uh, that's, that's very important. 
we maintain contact with uh, all political forces in Bangladesh, uh, which is a legitimate activity. All countries do it. Um, it's not just in Bangladesh, but uh, other countries do it in India. So we also uh, pursue within the uh, boundaries of diplomatic behavior. Uh, we maintain contacts with uh, different political forces, uh, different formations, and uh, but we deal with the government of the day. Ambassador, since you were talking about uh, our Western neighbor, there was talk even uh, at this summit, state visit, uh, in, in terms of security issues, terrorism, radicalization. Uh, how involved is Pakistan in what it used to be from Bangladesh territory in fomenting trouble in India? No, it's less now, but and and you know it it used to be much much more uh, under the earlier regimes, and I think uh, one of the uh, you know uh, most important uh, pillars of Sheikh Hasina's uh, domestic and uh, foreign policy has been to revive the spirit of 1971, which is what led to the creation of Bangladesh, and that was to assert Bangladesh's identity and uh, nationality. And uh, this has, I think, been a seminal contribution in the change in the narrative within Bangladesh. Because, you know, we have to keep in mind that today, the majority of the Bangladeshis were actually born after 1971. So they were born Bangladeshi. They were not born as Pakistanis. So they are born Bangladeshis. And the 20, 30-year-olds, they are all searching for an identity. And therefore, what Sheikh Hasina is doing is critical for uh, laying the foundations for the future trajectory of Bangladesh as an independent, sovereign, proud uh, country. In this whole uh, situation, Pakistan is very uncomfortable because uh, the earlier Pakistani narrative that, uh, you know, uh, religion trumps everything else uh, has clearly failed. And uh, today, uh, you have a situation where Bangladesh is actually uh, progressing far ahead of Pakistan, even in terms of stability, uh, etc., while maintaining its religious identity. But this mischief-making uh, proclivity of Pakistan uh, to create trouble for Bangladesh, for Sheikh Hasina in the past, and of course for India, is something we cannot ignore. And uh, one of the big contributions made by Sheikh Hasina, I think, has been that she has taken on the radicals and the terrorists and the extremists frontally, particularly those fomenting insurgencies in India, uh, those who enjoyed Pakistani support, uh, especially of their agencies, uh, etc. So ridding the country of these uh, extremist elements, these uh, terrorist groups, uh, has not been easy for her, and but it's been done, and uh, but yet, uh, given the behavior of Pakistan, which we are all familiar with, uh, we have to be wary and alert all the time. And on the Rohingya issue, uh, Ambassador, how do you see India's position and Bangladesh's position? What can be done to sort out the issue? Yeah, you know, the Rohingya is a, is a complex issue, you know. Uh, look, today there are about a million of them uh, in Bangladesh. And there was this big exodus in 2016 and 17 uh, from Myanmar. Uh, it's a very, actually, it's a very tragic situation where you have this vast humanity which is not acceptable either to Bangladesh or to Myanmar. And... Uh, uh, you know, Bangladesh has borne the brunt of it in terms of uh, hosting them. So what we have been doing is uh, giving Bangladesh economic assistance to you know, reduce the burden a little bit uh, of, the, uh, of the economic livelihood and uh, other, um, uh, you know, uh, liabilities that you, any country would face. Uh, but, you know, we know it. We've kind of hosted, you know, millions of Bangladeshi refugees uh, in 1971. So, and at the same time, we've been also contributing to some economic assistance in the Rakhine state uh, in Myanmar uh, to ensure that we create conditions where the Rohingyas can actually come back. 
and uh, we have been talking to both uh, sides bangladesh and myanmar that you know the only durable sustainable way forward is for you to sit together and talk and ensure that there is a return but it is voluntary and it takes place with dignity but i uh, yeah it's a, it's a big uh, security issue also because you know when you have this large number uh, then there are other forces which try to play and uh, not so friendly forces which try to use uh, the religious card try to radicalize and uh, try to foment trouble uh, for bangladesh for india so uh, it's not a happy situation because uh, it's so close to our borders uh, you know of course uh, some rohingyas have entered india which is uh, also a matter of concern for us uh, but we would like uh, you know this has been discussed uh, in the human rights commission in the unhcr uh, the oic has taken it up the european union has taken it up i think uh, everyone has to sit down to see uh, how to reduce the burden of this case load and you know there is a concept in humanitarian uh, law of third country settlement or third country resettlement and i think some of the e european and islamic countries uh, should consider uh, looking at some of these refugees and resettling them uh, in their countries this has been done i mean they've done it for the syrians they've done it for the southern bhutanese refugees uh, from uh, from our region uh, maybe 10 15 years ago so some dispersal some reduction of the burden is i think something which also apart from the direct dialogue should be looked at ambassador pankaj saran absolutely great as usual sh sharing your experience and your expertise uh, not just with me personally but with all our viewers at strat news global yeah. thank you so much thanks so much again thank you thank you and for our viewers do give us feedback about this interview you can always send your suggestions for topics of discussion or guests that you would like to be featured on strat news global i'm amitabh bravi